Okay, welcome back to the uh, Brookings Conference for the second session. Our first paper uh, this morning uh, in this session is by Herbert Jesus, Fernandez Vela Verde, and Chad Jones, Macroeconomic Outcomes in COVID-19, a Progress Report. So I understand, Jesus, you're starting off? I think I'm actually starting off, uh, but oh, you, you can hear me? Okay. Yeah, good. Great. Uh, so this paper is Macroeconomic Outcomes in COVID-19, a Progress Report. Um, what we do in this paper is focus on data on two outcomes that we care enormously about during the pandemic, um, namely uh, lost economic activity. So as measured, for example, by GDP or unemployment, and we'll also look at the Google mobility data, um, and then obviously deaths from COVID-19. So we're gonna look at data on these, these two key outcomes uh, across countries, uh, key international cities, and also US states. Um, and then also over time, we'll look at dynamics and see what lessons we can try out. And I guess the, you know, if I, if I had to summarize it in one key lesson, I think one of the key things we learn is that there are a heterogeneous set of places, Seoul, Tokyo, Germany, and Norway, that have good performance on both of these dimensions. And we should look particularly closely at what those places have done to figure out how to get these good outcomes in, in future pandemics. Um, okay, so, so to start, let me show you the, the COVID death outcome that you're all familiar with, but I think it's, it's helpful to, to put it in context. Um, throughout the, the paper, we're gonna look at deaths per million people. Um, and what you see when you look at the data is just an enormous, tremendous amount of heterogeneity. Um, I didn't put Taiwan on this chart, but Taiwan has fewer than one death per million. New York City has 2,800 deaths per million. So, you know, 2,800 fold difference. Um, if we look at Seoul in New York City or Tokyo in New York City, um, you know, these are both key global densely populated cities. And one of the messages from this heterogeneity is that density is not destiny, right? You can have densely populated cities with, with global contacts um, and they can have very, very different outcomes in terms of COVID deaths. And then you, you can look at you know, every place in between. Germany, 100 deaths per million. Bay Area and San Francisco, 200 deaths per million. Um, Mississippi, 800. Uh, Miami and Philadelphia, 1,000. Madrid and Stockholm, 1,400. And then again, up to New York with, with 2,800. So a very simplistic view of these two outcomes that I've mentioned that we care about, the, the deaths from COVID and losses in economic activity, say associated with GDP, a very simplistic view is kind of shown in, in this chart where you can think about shutting down the economy and that will result in the large loss in GDP, but maybe uh, at, with the benefit of saving a large number of lives. Alternatively, you can keep the economy open. That'll minimize the loss associated with GDP, at least in the short term but perhaps result in a large number of COVID deaths. Now we know this simplistic trade-off is just you know, highly imperfect. It doesn't really capture what's going on. And one of the reasons is that they're dynamics, right? So if we follow this keep the economy open path, we get a lot of deaths. We may then be forced to shut down the economy and end up with both large GDP losses and a large number of deaths. And so uh, you know, in some sense, there's, there's a shifting of this red curve back and, and, and forth associated with dynamics, associated with policy, and associated with luck. And so because of some combination of good policy or good luck, it may be possible to find yourself in this lower left quadrant with few deaths and a small reduction in economic activity. Conversely, with some combination of bad policy and or bad luck, you could end up with a large number of deaths and large losses in GDP. And so you put these things together and you realize that if we look at the data, we're very unlikely to find sort of a, a nice smooth relationship between do, these two things. We're much more likely to see a cloud and disentangling the dynamics, the bad policy and the bad luck is an extremely challenging uh, exercise. Uh, it's, it's one we don't even attempt here. It's, uh, instead, we're just gonna show you the data and, and, and talk through uh, the outcomes. Okay, so here on the horizontal axis, you have COVID deaths per million people. This is the international country level evidence. On the vertical axis, I've got the GDP loss. And just to give you a sense of how to measure the GDP loss, here's the United States. You remember that 2020 Q2 saw a loss of about 10%, Q1 maybe a loss of 1%, um, but that's only for a, a quarter and a half or two quarters. And so if we asked how much 
of our annual GDP have we lost so far in the United States? That turns out to be just around 3%. So the US loss in economic activity is the equivalent to losing 3% of annual GDP. Okay, so now go up, go up here to the upper right of the graph and you see you know, the, the usual suspects, Spain, the United Kingdom, Italy, for example, that experienced large deaths from COVID and also large losses in economic activity. So e losses equivalent to six or 7% of a year's worth of GDP. A country that uh, has been talked about a lot, uh, already some today is Sweden. Um, Sweden, when you compare it to the United Kingdom, looks much better, right? So similar numbers of deaths around, you know, 550, 600 deaths per million people, similar deaths to the UK and Italy, but much smaller losses in GDP, equivalent to about 2% of a year's GDP instead of six or 7%. And so looked at that way, Sweden seems like a success story. On the other hand, it's very important to come over here to the, the lower left corner of the graph where we see a remarkably large number of countries concentrated, including Norway, Korea, uh, Taiwan, Japan, uh, Denmark, uh, and, and Germany, where you know, Norway is a natural comparison to Sweden. And when you compare Sweden to the UK, they look great. When you compare Sweden to Norway, it looks like much, much less successful. Norway has a similar loss in GDP, around 2% of a year's worth of GDP, but with 50 deaths per million people instead of 500 deaths per million people. And so uh, one takeaway from this graph already is that there are a large number of countries in this, in this you know, lower left quadrant that experienced good outcomes on both dimensions. Uh, for the state level evidence, our economic activity measure is excess unemployment. And so let me highlight uh, California here in New York State. Right? Both California and New York State experienced similar losses in economic activity as measured by excess unemployment. And the way to read this graph is it's as if California and New York have had unemployment rates that are four and a half percentage points above normal for an entire year. Okay, that's the, that's the amount of uh, excess unemployment they've experienced. And it's similar numbers. Both states were hit very early by the coronavirus. Both states shut down early and both states have, have you know, lost a lot of economic activity. On the other hand, you look at the death outcomes and they really are strikingly different. 1,700 deaths in, in New York per million people versus 300 deaths per million people in California. Again, if you look at the lower left quadrant here, there are a lot of states in this, but it starts to make you wonder about the role of luck versus policy. So that's a, a, a theme I'll come back to. Okay, the GDP unemployment data are great, but they have obvious drawbacks, namely they're, they're released with a substantial lag. And so we also turn to the Google Mobility Reports data. We're gonna use the retail and restaurants component. Um, and there's a, a pretty good correlation with the GDP loss in the excess unemployment numbers I've already showed you. Uh, so, so we think these data are a useful measure of economic activity. They have the huge advantage that they're available, you know, at a daily frequency, updated quite, quite frequently, and at an enormous geographical uh, disaggregation. So you could see Seoul and Stockholm and Tokyo, which had much smaller sort of shutdowns in economic activity, losses in economic activity, relative to Lombardy, Paris, Madrid, uh, New York, and London. We could look across states, and you see, you know, New York and California, Florida and Arizona, uh, Texas, DC. Um, this other gray line is Hawaii. And then, you know, the Google mobility data, as you've appreciated, is just great for the sort of subtleties you can capture. And so, you know, this, this bump up here in early August is the Sturgis motorcycle rally, Harley, Harley Davidson rally in, in, in South Dakota. Um, so there's a lot to be learned from this mobility data. Here's a parallel graph using the mobility data. So cumulative reduced activity in, in a, at an annual basis. Um, you know, for the countries, and you can see this graph looks very much like the GDP graph I just showed you, sort of confirming that this high correlation between Google mobility data and GDP gives us a similar message. A nice thing we can do with the mobility data though is look at the cities. Uh, so key global cities around the world. And you know, we saw New York State and California, you can also look at New York City versus the San Francisco Bay Area. And there the difference is even more striking. Again, similar losses in economic activity, but radically different mortality outcomes. So the Bay Area has lost you know, 200 deaths versus 2,800 deaths per million in New York City. But again, there are these sort of key global cities, you know, Seoul struck early by the pandemic uh, 
and yet has had much, much better economic outcomes and death outcomes, even than California. And so it, the Bay Area looks good. The Bay Area is kind of the parallel of Sweden and the other side. The Bay Area looks good compared to New York City, but we have lost a lot of economic activity and perhaps learning from Tokyo and Seoul and Germany and Norway, uh, we could have done even better. Um, uh, in the next few minutes, let me focus in on another advantage of the Google Mobility data, which it allows us to look at dynamics. So horizontal axis is the same one you've seen, only now on a ratio scale to make it uh, easier to read. The vertical axis, this is monthly data now. So this is the just the monthly Google Mobility report, how much activity was reduced each month. And look at the green, uh, that's the UK. So this is um, March and then April. So April is kind of the peak loss in, in Google activity across many, many regions, states, countries, and cities. Uh, May, June, July, August, and then September has the is, is in blue and has the country uh, or city name after it. Um, so what you can see here is that you know the pandemic hit, deaths increased rapidly, and then deaths kind of stabilized. And as deaths stabilize, economic activity starts to resume. And you can see in Norway or Germany or Italy or Sweden, you know, they're at 10% reduced activity in September rather than um, you know 40 or 50 or 60 or 70. Um, Bunch of other countries. Let me just highlight India and Mexico in this graph. India is in green, and you can see. It. First of all, a lot of countries have this sort of vertical movement as death stabilized, but not India and Mexico. India is still moving to the right. Mexico in purple is just moving to the right. And interestingly, is that is these these countries move to the right? They're moving down, so they're not shutting down economic activity. Instead, economic economic activity is resuming as the number of deaths continue to rise in Mexico and India. And that's, a, that's an interesting dimension to the, to the crisis. Let me skip this uh, global cities to focus on a few other cities. Um, San Francisco Bay Area, Los Angeles, Miami, and Houston are kind of like India and Mexico in the sense that they're still moving to the right. You're not seeing this vertical move that you see, say, in Chicago or Boston or New York or Philadelphia or other places. Uh, they continue to move to the right. And then finally, let me um, uh, highlight some states. Again, the state level evidence from the Google Mobility Reports, same thing. It's stabilized in, in many places, um, not quite in Washington, not quite in California. And then a few other states where we've seen, again, this sort of continued increase in deaths. So Florida and Arizona lie on top of each other here. If, if you see the, um, the vertical axis is changing, so it might have been better to, to keep that the same, um, uh, the activity levels are lower, or the reductions are lower, um, so activity is even higher in Florida and Arizona, uh, Texas and Georgia, Alabama, and then finally Montana and South Dakota are interesting states to look at. Um, again, in April, everyone you know, shut down quite considerably in terms of activity, but resumed quite quickly in Montana and South Dakota, and you've seen deaths continue to increase. And South Dakota is an interesting contrast with the Bay Area. Um, South Dakota, you know, not densely populated at all. Um, we're not seeing the effects of uh, the Sturgis motorcycle rally yet. Uh, it's a little too soon maybe, but that's what this, you know, dot is here. Um, but South Dakota has more deaths per capita, uh, 250 instead of 200 in the San Francisco Bay Area. And so again, I think there's, um, Lots to be learned from the dynamics in these data. Let me turn it over very quickly to Jesus to, to tie things together and bring out some, some nuances. Thank you. So um, the evidence today can be summarized in this figure where we have uh, the four quadrants created by the Cartesian product of two variables, COVID death and GDP losses. As uh, Chad explained before, in the upper right quadrant, we have New York City, Lombardy, Madrid, etc., with high COVID mortality and GDP losses. Below them, we have Sweden with a moderate GDP loss but high COVID deaths. In the opposite quadrant, we have California with high GDP losses and low COVID deaths. And finally, we see a number of regions from Germany, Norway, Taiwan, Kentucky, Montana with low COVID deaths and moderate GDP losses. And probably the most important lessons for us from this paper is how many observations we have in this lower left quadrant. Our current reading of the evidence is that 
you know, lack may have played a, 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 poly, a, a role, but the heterogeneity that exists in this quadrant suggests that there must be something more than just lack. We have places like Seoul and Tokyo that are large, immensely dense cities, and we also have Montana and Norway that are low density locations. We have countries like Taiwan and South Korea that had been scared in the past because of SARS and MERS. And we have countries like Germany and Norway that had not been touched by previous scarce health epidemics. And yet all these countries seem to have been doing much better than their neighbors. Norway seems to have done much better than Sweden. Uh, uh, Germany has seemed to be done much better than the United Kingdom or France. And while the evidence is still not fully settled, and as you probably know, right now, Europe is starting to go through a very, very serious second wave with countries like France and Spain back in a very tight spot. And hence, where each country may end up in six months is still something that remains to be seen. At least our reading of the evidence is that we want to spend a lot of time thinking about what Germany, what Norway, uh, what Taiwan may have done right to stay in that lower quadrant instead of falling in any of the other three places. That's it. We finish right on time, I think. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, discussant is Andy Atkinson. Well, we're getting set up. Andy has, uh, I think, the first paper in this area for economists back in uh, March. Uh, th thank you very much for having me here and uh, uh, to discuss this paper. And I'll look to get through in my allotted twelve minutes. Um, so. Uh, Many of us have been watching both the economic outcomes and the death outcomes associated with COVID. Uh, we see rich dynamics. Uh, deaths fell in many places between March and April, and then are slowly recovering. And then we have various patterns of deaths, some steep increases and falls. And then as pointed out, I guess for India and Mexico, but here I'm showing India and Brazil, you know, slower growth and, and, and maintaining uh, high levels of deaths for long periods of time. And this paper usefully organizes these outcomes into this uh, summary quad, you know, summary plot, where we might think of the roles of luck and policy in determining which quadrant you, you end up in. And what I want to do in my discussion is just give like a back of the envelope model related to the one we saw just in the previous session to maybe interpret what do we mean by luck and what do we mean by policy. So if I want to think about what's driving the data, let's think in terms of a behavioral SIR model, similar to what we saw in the previous session. And I'm going to think about two sources of differences across locations. There will be uh, just a fixed effect in what is the disease transmission given the level of activity. And we'll see that is something that could be determined by the disease itself. It could be determined by density cultural practices, you know, do you bow versus shake hands? Who knows what, you know, do you, do you ride on the subway? There's been a lot of things discussed. And then a second source of heterogeneity across regions would be in the behavioral response, what is the elasticity of the response of activity to the level of infections um, uh, that we are prevalent in the, at the moment? And I'm just going to think of those two differences as an interpretation for luck and policy, where the first one I'll just call luck. There's not much you can do about it. And the second is policy. And I picked a behavioral SIR model just because um, it's going to be consistent with key facts we've seen about COVID worldwide. I documented work with uh, Karen Kopecki and Tao Jia that we saw initially high and highly dispersed reproduction numbers across locations in the world right at the start of the epidemic. And then quite rapidly, those re reproduction numbers fell essentially everywhere uh, down near, you know, close to one and have stayed there since. So uh, the model that I, I write down is taken John Luca Violante, I think used it in a previous discussion. The equations on the left hand side are the standard equations for an SIR model. And what augments the model to make it behavioral is on the right-hand side, I have two equations. Y is the level of activity and beta IT is the transmission rate. So this gives a function that says, 
higher activity will result in faster transmission of the disease, but there's this fixed effect beta bar I that might differ across regions. So that shifts the transmission rate given the level of activity. And the second equation that in the behavioral model is the behavioral part, uh, given the level of infections, capital IT, you know, how does fear or policy responses or whatever get people to reduce their activity? Why? And so, and we're going to think of that elasticity sigma i is potentially differing across locations. So that could be, you know, the political differences that were highlighted in the previous session uh, affecting the, the endogenous responses of individuals, or it could be how aggressively authorities respond in terms of lockdowns uh, to the disease state. And so what I'm gonna do is two experiments. I'm gonna just have three stylized regions. The first thing I'm gonna vary is the beta bar term. The second thing I'm gonna vary is the sigma i term. And so first I'm varying the beta bar. How, what is transmission given activity? And so I simulate the model for 180 days. We get a decline in activity early on and a slow recovery, a spike in daily deaths and a fall. In the lower left quadrant, we see the effective reproduction number start at initially dispersed levels and then fall close to one uh, for the remainder of the time. And in the lower white quadrant, we have, I just did that dynamics graph uh, that they showed, that, that, that Jesus and Chad showed previously but I guess with log cumulative deaths on the x-axis. But the key takeaway from this experiment is that if you look at the cumulative loss of life and the cumulative loss of activity over 180 days, you get a very nice upward sloping line. There's a region up here that has a lot of death and uh, a lot of lost activity and a region down here that has very little death and uh, very little uh, lost activity. And in the model that's chalked up to this fixed effect uh, that just says in your region, a given level of activity translates into a higher uh, infection rate. So in the second experiment where I make instead the elasticity vary, we again see these early declines in activity and recovery, different shapes of the deaths across the regions, the fall in the effective reproduction number happens again, the dynamic patterns that we saw before but now the slope of the line goes the other way. So uh, we have a region that uh, is not very responsive and it gets uh, a lot of deaths, but less lost activity and a region up here that is very responsive and it has uh, fewer deaths and uh, significantly more uh, lost activity. And so it's naturally, if you think about it, that you could combine you know, this, to these two sources of heterogeneity and you could get a cloud. Uh, I guess this is an older version of the graph uh, that uh, was shown, where we have on the x-axis the COVID deaths per million people and some measure of lost cumulative lost activity on the y-axis. And let's think about Sweden, which everybody likes to talk about. Uh, as pointed out, Sweden looks quite bad relative to the United Kingdom, and Sweden looks uh, I'm sorry, it looks quite good relative to the United Kingdom, and it looks quite bad relative to some of its neighbors. Uh, I, I'm not going to focus on the names, but let's think about, well, actually, I, in this case, I will. Let's think about how could we tell how much of this is luck versus policy? So a hint, I think, comes from the data on daily deaths. If we look at, uh, this is a plot that shows new deaths per day on a logarithmic scale, it's actually a seven day moving average for these six countries that we mentioned. And if you look carefully at this plot, the UK and Sweden seem to have in common that the increase in deaths was very steep early on in compared to these other countries. You know, right, I, you can't quite see in the beginning here, but you might estimate a basic reproduction number before policy kicks in that's higher for the UK and Sweden than it is for these other countries. And then the how fast this death rate comes down would have to do with the elasticity of the response. So let me just give a caveat. This is not an estimation. This is something I made up. 
But here's some parameter values that I'm going to call this dot Sweden. I mean, sorry, the UK, and it has a high, uh, what I call a basic reproduction number, how the epidemic is going to grow right at the beginning. Sweden down here has a little bit lower than the UK, and but the UK has a higher elasticity than Sweden. And this gives us, you know, this thing that the UK has uh, essentially uh, much more lost activity for the same number of deaths as Sweden. And then over here, we have these uh, a representative of these countries in the lower left-hand side that uh, uh, they benefited from having a lower effective reproduction number. The hint at that is that they had a lower growth rate of new deaths right at the beginning of the epidemic. And, uh, uh, and then they have the UK's elasticity. And so we see Sweden has essentially the same GDP loss or activity loss uh, and, and many more deaths than them. So on the basis of this, I haven't done it. This would be related to what went on in the previous session. You could do counterfactuals and say, you know, what if Sweden had had Denmark's, uh, you know, beta bar I, or what if Sweden had had the UK's elasticity? You could do a lot of different counterfactuals. Uh, when I look at the data that they're showing in this paper, and I interpret it in the context of this kind of very simple model, the fact that a lot of the data seems to line up on this you know, upward sloping line uh, suggests to me, well, I, I should step back. The first point is simple comparisons of outcomes are probably not very informative. We need to do some kind of more structural analysis to figure out what's going on. But this suggests to me that luck is actually playing a, uh, uh, an important role. And I think uh, the way you would verify that is to go back and say, are the people, up, are the regions up here, did they have evidence of a high basic reproduction number right at the beginning of the beginning of the epidemic, very fast growth? And did the regions down here have evidence of a low basic reproduction number or when they got hit by the epidemic, they had a uh, relatively slow growth. So that's um, my discussion and thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Andy. Uh, we have a question, uh, go, go to questions. I see Caroline Hoxby. Hi, um, thanks very much for this paper I, and the discussion. Uh, I thought it was terrific. I learned a lot from it. I wanted to ask a question about compliant or non-compliant behavior, because that seems to me like an important uh, mediating factor in um, that in, in how much you need to shut down economic activity and, and contacts and uh, mobility and things like that in order to reduce the spread of the coronavirus. For instance, when you look at the difference between Northern California, the San Francisco Bay Area and Los Angeles, they're really under very similar regulations the entire time. They're being told to do the same thing. So what's the difference? What's the explanation? It's probably not a density explanation because in fact, if anything, you know, San Francisco is a somewhat denser uh, city than Los Angeles is. But I, my understanding is there's quite a difference in co how compliant the behavior is. So it's, and you know, one thing where we're, when people have said this about Sweden is that you can do things in Sweden that you couldn't do in the United States because Swedes are more likely to be compliant with the rules that are made. So I wonder whether there's any any data that you can get out of Google or some something else that suggests how compliant people are. You know, how many people are, how many masks are being purchased? Um, other other types of things that might be a bit more like surveillance almost to to try to determine how compliant uh, people are. Yes. So let me let me. Hey, so let let's me. let's collect questions. Oh, then. sorry, 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 my mistake. Okay, Martin Bailey. Can you hear me now? Yep. Um, you use deaths um, in one of the studies that I looked at. They were looking at. Uh, confirmed cases in relation to deaths. And there were very, very wide differences 
in the ratio of deaths to confirmed cases. Now, maybe, uh, and I don't know the data as you guys do, but maybe that simply reflects uh, differences in, in reporting, but it did appear that the differences were so wide that uh, one of the uh, outcome, one of the things that's gonna affect the outcome is uh, how many people die given uh, relative to the number of uh, actual cases. So in, in this data that I looked at, the US actually did fairly well. It has a huge number of cases. So uh, whatever policy or behavior, uh, we have a very large number of cases, but the number of deaths is actually muted uh, because the number of deaths per case is much lower than uh, most of the other OECD countries. Same is true for uh, Germany. Um, same is true, I think, for Japan. I didn't look at uh, uh, Korea. And when you looked at France or the UK, the number of deaths in relation to the number of cases uh, was much larger. So I just wondered if that was um, an intermediating factor that should be uh, considered or whether the data is not good enough. Thank you. Ken Rogoff. Oh, uh, yeah, j uh, just a couple, one question and a comment. So the, the question simply, uh, to what extent is this, are the outcomes very heavily affected by nursing home protocols, which seem to be a huge issue in the in looking at variation in the United States or even the commonness of nursing homes, which they don't have so much in developing economies, which has been held out as one reason it didn't spread as fast. I guess a second point is in a few years, it'll be obviously interesting to think about life expectancy, morbidity, as opposed to just deaths, uh, as, as, which is a very crude measure of the health outcomes. Thank you. Mervyn King. The, the data discussed so far are for COVID-19 deaths. Even that internationally is not easy to make comparisons on because the definition of a COVID-19 death varies from one location to another. And that's why a number of people have looked at excess deaths relative to say a five-year living average, monthly excess deaths. That has one advantage, which is you can look at the period before COVID. And what is very interesting is that countries which had low excess deaths in 2019 had higher excess deaths in 2020, which we now attribute to COVID-19. And that's a particular factor that singles out Sweden and the UK, in addition, I think, to the nursing home point that was made. But it's also highly relevant to a comparison between Sweden and Norway, because one of the big differences between those two countries was that Norway had a lot of deaths in 2019 relative to their expected number. Sweden had fewer. And so Sweden caught up in 2020 when COVID-19 hit. And I think this is very relevant to Andy's point of interpreting what's happened in terms of luck. It's not so, it, luck in quotes can also refer to the starting point and the, um, the prevalence of countries in terms of their vulnerability to an epidemic of an infectious disease, uh, as opposed to just policy issues. Now, it'll be a long time before we know the answer to it, but I think there's some merit in looking also at excess deaths uh, because that enables you to look at the period before COVID-19 and not just what's happened this year. But there were excellent, excellent presentation and an excellent discussion too. Thanks, um, Jason Furman. Um, uh, it's a great uh, paper and discussion. I have a mental model that makes sense of some of the lack of correlation and wanted to see what you think of it, which is economic performance is a function of two things. One is when there's more virus, that's worse for your economy. The second is when you're more averse to the virus, you take bigger steps for any given amount of virus, and that is also um, worse for your economy. So you look at a place like New Zealand they should be reaping huge benefits from how little virus they have, 
But when they get just a few cases, they start to do pretty extensive um, shutdowns. And that something like that might explain why over the summer, um, you know, when Arizona, California, Florida were spiking in terms of the virus, economic activity there was just the same as it was in Connecticut, Maine, and Vermont, um, because those states were less averse to the virus than um, the Northeastern states were. So do we think there's some like underlying parameter there um, that you know, some places do more, some places do less in response to the same amount that's inversely correlated with the virus. And that's why you sort of cancel out and don't see a strong relationship between how much virus and your economic performance. Thanks, Bob Hall. Okay. Yep, Bob, I think you're, my, you're, you're good. Okay, great, thanks. Um, in terms of randomness, um, there's been an interesting speculation uh, on the relationship uh, of, of COVID to tuberculosis, which is negative. Uh, countries like India, where tuberculosis is, is uh, endemic, uh, uh, have very substantially lower um, COVID death rates. Um, and there's some speculation uh, uh, Jesus assures me that uh, the speculation is bogus, but um, that this is relates to uh, um, treatment of uh, vaccination against tuberculosis, which is widely practiced in third world countries like India. Um, and there's some indication, maybe, maybe, maybe not, uh, uh, that that's what that the that uh, treatment or that that. Uh, uh, drug is uh, has some effect against uh, COVID. Thanks. Uh, Tristan Reed. I just wanted to ask a question to see if you had tried to put in. Um, okay, Tristan, you should be up. Hello? Can you hear me? Tristan? Okay, uh, can't get any audio. Uh, we're gonna move on to Elaine Buckler. Okay, Elaine. Can you hear me now? Yep, you're good. Wonderful, thanks for this great paper. I saw Jesus's comment that trust in government didn't work well. But I wonder if part of the question is actually more willingness to behave in the interest of the common good versus um, individualism. And one way to get at this, at least for some countries, might be looking at some fiscal variables in terms of size of government budget or size of transfers. Um, although that might not work as well for some Asian countries, which of course have this historical behavior of wearing masks to protect others. But you might go down that alley. Okay, Tristan, are you online? Are you want to? Can you, wanna can you hear up? me now? Yeah, now you're good. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so, so in my paper at the last um, uh, Brookings panel with with Penny Goldberg, we we did some of these cross country regressions as well, and found a lot of explanatory power of health covariates, uh, the age distribution, um, obesity, and then actually population density. Um, so, I, I wondered if you'd throw those in, and and maybe you know that's a few ways to at least project luck onto a few observables. Um, and see how much you can account for with that. Thanks. Yeah, I'll, in, I'll endorse that. That's a terrific suggestion. Let me make, I don't see, uh, don't see any more hands. So let me just make one comment myself. <laughs> I think this paper and the uh, previous one, both, uh, I'm gonna step back to a, a, like a higher level comment here. This paper and the previous one focused on lost economic output versus lives in one way or another, either it's through uh, in, uh, shutdowns uh, you know, uh, uh, mandated in, in local areas or here, we're just thinking about that chart that you have. 
I think that's a reasonable framing for much of what happened in March and maybe in April. I think that starting in May and certainly where we are right now, we know that there's much more going on. And this gets at the point Mervyn King raised one of them, I believe it was, which is uh, which is um, thinking about protections for the elderly, although maybe that was somebody else who raised that. But there's many, many, many other rich uh, dimensions in which uh, in which uh, the virus can be uh, contained at the same time as really not impacting the economy. So masks is an obvious one. Uh, testing and quarantine is another obvious one. But you know, the, it seems to me that if we think about what the lessons are from these papers going forward, uh, the, the focusing on actually adhering and doing the things that are both good for deaths and good for the economy uh, make a lot of sense. In every one of these papers, uh, People, the preferences are such that people would rather live than die and they'd rather work than not. And uh, there are NPIs that go in that direction. Uh, and that's what we need to remember for policy. And if anything, here I'll editorialize, the tragedy is that we've decided that that's not the direction that we want to go. And we want to leave the local, admit, the local officials only with one option, which is not a terrific one. Okay, back to the authors. And you don't have to respond to that. That was just editorializing. Yes, don't worry. Uh, so first of all, also let me then return with a meta comment, if I may. Had I done this presentation two weeks ago, I would have leaned a little bit more towards luck. Having seen the second wave in Europe and having followed the second wave in Europe over the last three weeks in a lot of detail, uh, it really strikes me that policy makes a huge difference. You are seeing countries like Italy versus Spain. Uh, Spain, the epidemic is again totally out of control. ICU units, beds in Madrid are over 100% capacity again on September 23rd. ICU units in Milan are not. So, you know, maybe what happened in San Francisco versus New York was due to bad luck back in February. What is happening in Milan versus Madrid right now is, I think, in my opinion, very clearly due to some policy decisions. And, and I think that if, if we can have a, a, a follow up in six months, one year, some of these, these ideas will be uh, much, much uh, um, clearer. Uh, with respect, there were a lot of fantastic questions. Uh, for instance, the, the issue of excess debts uh, came out. Uh, we have, Chad and I have another paper where we do a little bit more of formal econometrics. And over there, we actually use excess debts uh, instead of measured debts by John Hopkins University. Things do not change that much because actually there is some indication that countries that have had the worst death scenarios like Spain or Italy were also the countries that undercounted the most. So if anything, using excess debts um, make things much, much worse. And both Spain and Italy did not have excess debts in 2019. Actually, I, I can tell you because I look at both countries in a lot of detail, both Spain and Italy had relatively good mortality in, in 2019. So this may explain a little bit of Norway versus Sweden. You are not going to get very far to explain Lombardy or Madrid versus uh, Bavaria. Uh, it will be um, great also to have good measures of compliance, social trust, etc. I think this is very important. And I think that as, as it has been pointed out, even in the US, you see a states like Vermont or Maine that have done much better than other similar states. And I hope no one take offense that, you know, if you have this very stupid stereotypical view of people in Vermont and Maine being very well behaved and following the rules more than perhaps people in Philadelphia, if I might say so. And um, in that sense, it will be fantastic if maybe in one year or so we have a little bit of better uh, measures of this type of, of compliance issues. There is some data on mask use. I'm not sure how much of this data we can believe. Maybe if we live in a, in a totalitarian society like China, where everyone is recorded, we could actually check videos and, and, and measure things. But we have, I think, a graph about mask use in the paper, and, and we make a little bit of, of discussion about it. Uh, and also, finally, let me, uh, because I, I don't want to run out of time, I fully agree with Ken and, and Jim comments about other outcomes, long run health consequences, etc. And unfortunately, I will be the first to be able to say a little bit better about this. It's, it's just too early. We just don't have any of those data. And 
And this will be something that maybe in five years, when we do the, the Brookings five-year retrospective on, on COVID, we, I will be able to give you a better answer. The chat, I don't know if you want to add something else. I, know, I think that was great. I think the, the only thing I would add that hasn't really come out yet in, in the, the discussion so much as I think it deserves to is sort of the, the luck involved with timing. So if, if, we, yeah. if we'd written this paper back in May, for example, Arizona would have looked great. Mon Montana and South Dakota, you know, still look great, but you could see them in the graph moving to the right. And I think, you know, I, I think there's an element of luck, which is, is not always obvious in the slope of the death curve because, you know, Arizona didn't have a big slope for a long time, and then they started to have a, a, a big slope, or Miami. Florida looked good early on, and, and then, then didn't look good. So I think there's also a bit of a luck involved with timing. And so, as Jesus was saying, six months or a year from now, we may look back at things and, and see a, a different version of these graphs. So thanks very much for all the comments, and Andy's great discussion. Okay, Andy, you get, you get for unusually, you get the last word, but it's got to be brief. Yes, uh, so uh, in response, well, I guess a small thing in response to Jason Furman's question, uh, I interpret the elasticity of the response of activity to infections as capturing what you were discussing with regard to New Zealand. Is this a very aggressive response to the disease state? But I think the broader question of luck versus policy and what Chad just said, I think one of the big lessons from the Spanish flu is that you know some places were hit in the first wave hard and others not. And then other places were hit in the second wave hard and sort of uh, that element of luck and, you know, what, <clears throat> you know, density is not a good proxy. There's some, there's something else going on that's determining uh, <clears throat> how you get hit and, and disentangling that from policy is going to be hard. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much. Let's move on to the next paper. And Matt, I believe, Yoda Rito is presenting. All right, is that on? Yep, uh, yes, we don't see your slides. Okay, looks good. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, um, thanks to the organizers for having us. This is going to be a somewhat narrower paper, I think, than the previous ones. We're focused entirely on labor market dynamics, and we're trying to understand the role of temporary unemployment and trying to both understand what's happened in the last several months. And then we're gonna try to do something a little more ambitious, which is to try to come up with some forecasts for the future using a calibrated model. Uh, this is joint work with Jessica Gallant, Corey Croft, Fabian Lang, um, they're uh, all in Canada right now. And I'm Matt Nodowidigdo, and I'm at University of Chicago Booth School of Business. I'm gonna do one slide to motivate the, the paper. So I think this is pretty clear to everybody, but the, the COVID-19 recession is a very unusual recession. Um, it's had an extremely rapid increase in the unemployment rate, record shattering UI claims. What I think is a little bit less uh, remarked on is that the increase in unemployment has been much larger than the corresponding drop in job vacancies breaking the beverage curve, the historical relationship, the negative relationship between unemployment and job vacancies. Um, this is most colorfully shown by this recent tweet by Catherine Rampell, who writes that the beverage curve is drunk. She's showing here the enormous increase in unemployment, um, but a much smaller uh, corresponding drop in vacancies. And that's something we're going to try to understand in this paper. The other, the other way that the recession is unusual is that typically re recessions begin with a large increase in job separations, followed by some period of time of relatively low job finding rates. Um, but in our analysis of the data, we actually find that job finding rates have remained relatively high during the first several months of the COVID-19 recession. And so the motivation I'm trying to give here is we want to see the extent to which temporary unemployment um, can account for some of the trends that we've been seeing. And I want to just define temporary unemployment right off the bat. These are workers who've been laid off, but believe that their unemployment is going to be temporary and that they'll be recalled to their former employer. So what we do in this paper is we develop a search and matching model building on some of our own prior work that distinguishes between temporary and permanent unemployment. And the key idea, which I think is pretty intuitive, is that if workers believe that their unemployment is temporary, then they're going to impose less congestion on the search and matching process. Basically, they'll be waiting instead of searching. And that might have implications for the job finding rates of other unemployed workers. 
we're going to develop that model and then we're going to calibrate it using current population survey data. And all of the calibration is going to be using data prior to 2020, i.e. prior to the start of the pandemic in the United States. And then going back to the motivation, we're going to use the calibrated model to try to adjust the beverage curve and make sense of what's going on there. We're going to adjust based on the composition of the unemployed along a number of dimensions, including whether the unemployed are temporary or permanent, and also building on our previous work, whether they're short-term unemployed or long-term unemployed. And then I'm going to conclude by giving some forecasts of the unemployment rate over the next 18 months under different scenarios, i.e. different assumptions about the path of job vacancies, job separations, and the recall rate of the temporary unemployed. Okay. I want to just highlight a couple papers to give some background on where we're coming from. There were two Brookings papers by Elsby et al. on the dynamics of recessions, both historical recessions as well as the Great Recession. I think these are good papers to compare to our work just to see how the Great Recession is different. And then we're building on our own work, Croft et al. here, as well as Kruger, Kramer, Cho, which is another Brookings paper, in that we're going to have a search and matching model that we're going to write down. And the main distinction is that we're going to add um, temporary and permanent unemployment. And then finally, in terms of our data and measurement, the way that we think about the temporary unemployed, we're building on two recent papers by Forsyth et al. Okay, so our data is going to be two main sources, the current population survey data, that's monthly data, which we're going to use both the cross-sectional dimension and panel data. We're going to use that to measure labor market states, and we're going to use it to divide the temporary unemployed into two different groups. The waiting temporary unemployed, those are workers that we're going to assume are not actively searching. And then there's going to be a subgroup of the temporary unemployed who are actively searching, TA, and they're going to behave somewhat similar to the permanent unemployed in the model. Each month, we're going to measure stocks of each of these groups, and we're also going to measure month-to-month -month transition rates between these groups. We're going to combine the CPS data with job vacancies data from JOLTS, just as we've done in our previous work. The way that we measure the temporary unemployed is going to draw on these papers by Forsyth et al, as well as guidance from the BLS. And one thing I want to highlight off the bat is that we're going to include in the group of temporary unemployed workers who say they're employed but are absent for other reasons and unpaid. This matters for sort of capturing the early dynamics of the COVID recession. I've already described how we divide the temporary unemployed into the waiting and active temporary unemployed. And then we're gonna estimate the month to month transition rates in the same way we've done in previous work, which is we're gonna estimate them in a way to impose consistency across the measured stocks each month. And you can look to the paper for more details on how we do that. All right, I'm going to go through in just about a minute or so some motivating figures to understand why we wrote down the model the way we did. So everyone listening has seen the trends in unemployment rate. Um, I'm now breaking out unemployed into permanent unemployed and temporary unemployed. And what you see is that during the Great Recession, most of the increase in unemployment was permanent, whereas in the COVID-19 recession, most of the increase in unemployment was due to temporary unemployment. That's what I'm showing you here. Vacancies dropped very rapidly during the Great Recession, and they dropped as well during the beginning of the COVID-19 recession. But what we found interesting is that they have begun to recover and actually have already recovered a lot of the initial um, drop. Job separations, that is people going from employment into unemployment, most job separations have been transitioning into temporary unemployment during the first several months of the COVID recession. And so as a result, the share of unemployed workers who are temporary unemployed spiked during the first few months of 2020 has remained relatively high. It's gone down slightly, but it's still much higher than any time in the last uh, couple of decades. We also see uh, job finding rates remaining relatively high in recent months, um, certainly higher overall than compared to the Great Recession. And a lot of this looks like a somewhat of a composition effect is that temporary unemployed workers always historically have higher job finding rates than workers who've been permanently laid off. And if a lot of the unemployed are temporary unemployed, then just mechanically, you'd expect to see a higher overall job finding rate. That's our interpretation of the data here. Our model um, captures negative duration dependence. That's what really we started getting into. We got interested in this during the Great Recession, which is this idea that the longer workers are unemployed, the lower their job finding rates are. This figure shows that that's true in our data, both for permanent unemployed workers, as well as those who are temporary unemployed. And that's going to be captured in our model because as workers remain unemployed longer, their job finding rates are going to decline according to functions fit to the data that I'm showing you here. That in, in our intuition was that this would lead to a kind of hysteresis where if the, if the um, recession pr is prolonged, the longer workers are out of work, the lower job finding rates are going to be both for permanent and temporary unemployed workers. Here's one last motivating figure, which I think shows another way that this recession is unusual, which is that there are always temporary unemployed workers in, in recessions. Um, but as the recession goes on, there's a rising transition rate 
between temporary and permanent unemployment. You know, intuitively, if workers aren't recalled, then eventually they end up on permanently, permanent layoff and they have to start actively searching for a job. That's what I'm showing you here at the top. On the bottom, what's been interesting to us is that we don't see much evidence of a rising transition rate between temporary and permanent unemployment. If anything, it looks like the transition rates have actually switched, where there are some workers who report being on permanent layoff and then end up reporting on temporary layoff the following month, which I don't want to make too much of that because that could just be mostly a measurement issue. But what, what I think is very clear in this figure is we're not seeing rising transition rates from temporary to permanent unemployment yet. And I think I'm going to use Justin Wolfers and Betsy Stevenson here as represent, representatives of, I think, this conventional wisdom that the labor market has moved on from temporary layoffs to permanent layoffs. And we are not just seeing that in our analysis of the CPS data. And our analysis lines up with a recent working paper by Holland Kudlak, who also note that there has been no visible increase in transitions from temporary to permanent unemployment yet. Okay, so those are our figures for motivation that um, lead us to develop the following search and matching model. This slide is just reproducing the model that we developed in our previous work. It's a standard matching model. Market tightness here is given as the ratio of vacancies to total job search and job finding rates for those who've been permanently laid off, as well as the job finding rates for non-participants is given by this following function, in, which is a function of market tightness. What we add to this model is job finding rates for the temporary unemployed, those who are waiting around and those who are actively searching. Those who are actively searching, that's the TA, they find jobs either through being recalled or if they don't recall, if they're not recalled, then they start actively searching and find jobs at the similar job finding rate as the permanent unemployed. What else, the other thing that's new about this model is that we can then write down an expression for the total search of all of the non-employed workers, that is the unemployed workers and non-participants. It's given by the sum of the search effort of the permanent unemployed, the temporary unemployed that are actively searching and not waiting and the labor market non-participants. And so when we adjust the beverage curve, we're going to adjust it in the way given by this expression. And you can find more details of these formulas in the paper. Okay, we calibrate the model by using our CPS data to measure stocks and transition rates. We estimate duration dependence, the negative relationship between unemployment duration and job finding rates. We're going to assume that that's stable over time so we can pull all the data together. And then we're going to estimate the remaining model parameters, that is the parameters of the search model, using minimum distance over the pre-2020 period. We're gonna minimize the distance between job finding rates for each month, and that's all gonna be done using pre-2020 data. So if you look in the paper, what you'll see is that we find model parameter estimates that are pretty similar to the estimates we reported in our previous work that used only pre-2008 data. We find that reassuring because it suggests that the matching model parameters, the duration dependence parameters are fairly stable over time. So here's, our, here's the way we're going to assess the fit of the model. We're going to compare the model predicted job finding rates to the actual job finding rates for the all unemployed. So here we're combining the permanent and temporary unemployed together, and the paper shows the fit separately for the permanent and the temporary unemployed. So the model fits quite well. Um, that wasn't that surprising to us because the model fit quite well you know, before, during, and after the Great Recession, even before we added in this distinction between permanent and temporary unemployment. What I think was more interesting to us is um, the model fits well out of sample all through 2020. And in particular, if I compare the results of our model to a off the shelf model, the same model that we used in our previous work, the model used by Kruger et al. in the Brookings paper in 2014, we call that the single unemployment state model because this is a model that doesn't distinguish between permanent and temporary unemployment. Then the job finding rates that we predict out of that model are actually predicted to be falling during the last several months. And that's actually counterfactual. It doesn't match up with the observed job finding rates. And so this is our sort of first piece of evidence that the composition of unemployment, that is the share that are temporary and permanent, is important for understanding the recent path in job finding rates during the first few months of the COVID-19 recession. A model that just assumes that all of the unemployed are as if unemployed in previous recessions is going to end up um, understating the actual job finding rate and then in turn over predicting the overall unemployment rate. Okay, so now that we've um, calibrated the model, shown the fit, we're gonna, we're gonna do two things. First, we're gonna reassess these um, movements in the beverage curve. So here's the beverage curve as its standard form, vacancies over population on the y-axis and unemployment over population on the x-axis. And you see this huge outward shift that only begins to come back in the last several months. If you replace on the x-axis unemployment over population, 
with what our calibrated model says is an appropriate measure of total search effort divided by, by population, then you see a much less of an apparent outward shift and you see a much more well-behaved beverage curve during this time period. It suggests that market tightness, at least as measured by the ratio of vacancies to total search effort, may not have uh, changed that much um, in, recent, in, uh, in recent months. And in fact, if you look at these massive points here in 2020, they're right around where the points are in 2015, right around which you know, we historically would not have thought of as being a uh, particularly weak labor market. Okay, I'm gonna use the um, remaining time I have to then go through some predictions. These are forecasts from our model. What our model has endogenously is the job finding rates. What the model treats as outside of the model, the exogenous or what we call the forcing variables in the model are the path of job vacancies, job separations and the recall rate. So if we make different assumptions about the paths of those variables, then we can come up with different predict predictions or projections about the path of unemployment. What I'm showing you here is our baseline prediction, where we assume that those forcing variables gradually recover to the pre-2020-2019 levels um, over, a, over a period of 24 months. And according to that, our baseline model here, which I'm showing you in this dashed line in blue, predicts a, a pretty steady uh, recovery in terms of the unemployment rate. And importantly, it's more rapid than a model that doesn't distinguish between temporary and permanent unemployment. I want to remind you that our calibration here is all based on 2020 data and our predictions are based only on the model and those forcing variables that I described, vacancies, job separations, and the recall rate. So if you look in the early parts of 2020, what I'm showing you here is that our model does a pretty good job uh, replicating the path in the unemployment rate over the last several months, and it does much better than a calibrated model that doesn't distinguish between temporary and permanent unemployment that calibrated model predicts unemployment much higher for the last several months and would continue to predict unemployment much higher than our baseline scenario. You can compare the, our predictions to some forecasts, and we thank our discussant Gabe here for giving us some of these forecasts that we can use for comparison. These are CBO forecasts and the um, Fed forecasts. In our baseline scenario, we end up pre pre predicting something somewhat more optimistic than all of these scenarios, particularly as you go out into 2021. In order to match these scenarios, as we go through in the paper, it needs to be the case that we either see more pessimistic trends in job vacancies or separations, or what we call our stalling out scenario, where there's no recovery in any of our forcing variables over the next 24 months. So the summary of that is that we find that unemployment declines more rapidly. And I, I sort of see this as an internal consistency check of the professional forecast. For those forecasts need to be correct, through the lens of our model, it needs to be the case that we need to see some deterioration in either vacancies, job separations, or the recall rate of the temporary unemployed. We cite some survey evidence in the paper that when you ask workers whether jobs are hard to get, their answers are nowhere near the levels that, you, that were reported during the Great Recession. And so if I can be provocative here, it suggests that the jobs may not be scarce for the set of unemployed workers that are actively searching for a job. So in my last slide, I wanna just highlight the fact that our model indicates that temporary unemployment can provide one explanation for some of the unusual patterns in the data during the, during the COVID-19 recession. And I think what we take away from the model is that it suggests focusing somewhat less on the headline unemployment rate and instead looking more carefully at the composition of the unemployed alongside measures of job vacancies and job separations. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matt. Uh, the discussion is uh, Gabe Charter Wright. Okay, Jim, give me a thumbs up. You're good. Okay, uh, thanks a lot for inviting me to discuss uh, this very interesting paper. Uh, GKLN, as I'm going to refer to the author team, provide a very nice summary of the COVID labor market to date and a somewhat optimistic forecast of the path forward. In my discussion, I'm gonna play a bit of the skeptics role and give some reasons to temper their optimism uh, somewhat. To get there, I'll start with a brief overview of the COVID labor market, then I'm gonna review the GKLN exercise, and finally present uh, three key questions about the future of the recovery, uh, where I think their forecast uh, emits potentially adverse uh, forces. So I'm gonna start by laying out uh, four crucial aspects of the COVID labor market uh, to date. The first is that for all of its unusual features, the matching process has remained relatively stable once one conditions on the type of unemployment. And that is a key uh, and important finding uh, of this paper. The second is that there's been a historically high share of unemployed on temporary layoff who traditionally have high reemployment rates. 
Uh, the third is that separation rates into unemployment uh, from employment have remained high even as the labor market has recovered. And the fourth is an implication of the previous, which is that there is an unusually high amount of uh, churn. Uh, these figures are adapted from a recent paper of mine uh, with John Coglianese uh, that I'll refer to uh, a couple of times uh, in this discussion. I think they do a good job of sort of summarizing what's happened in terms of job finding and the importance of composition. So on the left panel, uh, I plot the historical average reemployment hazard rates by type of unemployment, and then in the dots uh, and squares, the hazard rates during the COVID recession. So you can see after falling in March and April, uh, the overall reemployment hazard from unemployment, that's these black dots, has risen uh, to a historically high level. At the same time, the reemployment hazard conditional on being on temporary layoff, that's these green circles, has actually been below its historical average. And if you look at all other types of unemployment, it's also been below its historical average. And in my paper with John, we split uh, the others into the permanent quits and entrance components, and they all look uh, sort of similar. Okay. So what's going on that each uh, part is lower uh, than the historical, but the overall is higher? Uh, it's all about the composition. Uh, on the right panel, I show the share of temporary layoffs among the total unemployed. Uh, it shot up to a historically high level and has remained uh, somewhat high uh, thereafter. Okay. So uh, the punchline is the recovery of the past few months is entirely driven by the fact that there were a historically high share of temporary laid off individuals. Uh, you'll note uh, that the temporary layoff share has, however, been declining, uh, and I'll uh, come back to that. Uh, the GKL and exercise is easy to describe. Uh, they write down a standard search and matching model uh, that accounts for heterogeneity among the unemployed. And in particular, they allow for different job finding rates for those on temporary layoffs and not searching. Uh, I'm gonna abuse notation a little bit. I'll call that UTW. Uh, let me note that that's roughly three quarters of all temporary layoffs uh, who don't search. Okay. Uh, then you have temporary layoffs who are searching and those are going to be tracked uh, by their duration of unemployment. And you have under, other unemployed who are also tracked uh, by their duration of unemployment. Uh, the exogenous driving forces are the number of vacancies, uh, the separations uh, from employment to unemployment and into non the labor force. Uh, transitions among unemployment states and non-labor force, and also the recall rate for those who are on temporary layoff and waiting. So again, that roughly three quarters of temporary layoffs uh, uh, have an exogenous recall rate. So the key endogenous outcome is a job finding rate of the searchers. And who are the searchers? Uh, they're the unemployed uh, by duration, uh, including those actively searching on temporary layoff and, um, and the non-labor force. The model fits the data well overall. Uh, so Matt showed you this picture that shows the job finding rate for the overall unemployed. Uh, in the paper, they split it uh, by the job finding rate for those who are permanent unemployed and those who are temporary unemployed. And remember the permanent unemployed, uh, these are all endogenous uh, outcomes and it does a pretty good job, although the levels are a little bit off in places. Uh, the really great fit is coming from the job finding rate of those who are temporary unemployed. But remember, this is somewhat by construction because three quarters of these uh, are uh, waiting and therefore uh, getting fit exogenously uh, by construction. Uh, a maybe more generous way of saying that is it's clear from these figures that if you didn't recognize the importance of temporary layoffs, you would be off in your labor market analysis to date. And that really comes through uh, in their paper. Okay. Now the paper has some stark implications uh, for the future. Uh, first, they project a much more rapid labor market recovery than most government or professional forecasters. And basically this comes from temporary layoffs returning to work at a high rate and new separations out of employment uh, continuing to decline. And I will say a point in their favor is that so far the professional forecasts have proven too pessimistic. Uh, so for example, uh, last week, uh, the Fed released a new uh, SEP uh, the median had an unemployment rate in 2020 Q4 of 7.6%. Uh, that's down from 9.3% uh, that was antici anticipated in June. Uh, second, they foresee relatively less long-term unemployment given how high uh, the unemployment rate went. And I'm going to dwell less on this aspect. I'll note that I agree with it fully. Uh, it's consistent with my work with John. And uh, it really reflects just the high amount of churn uh, in the COVID labor market so far. So that brings me to three uh, key questions. Uh, the answers to which I think will determine whether their forecast going forward uh, proves correct. Uh, the first concerns the reemployment hazards of the temporary unemployed, the second, the separation rate, and the third, uh, the general level of labor demand. Okay, so let me start with uh, the recall rate. 
So as of the August uh, employment report, there were 6.2 million individuals on temporary layoff, uh, which comes to 3.8% of the labor force. The overall unemployment rate was 8.4%. So you can see how rapid reemployment of these individuals would generate a, a fast labor market recovery. I showed you earlier that the reemployment hazard uh, from temporary layoff during COVID has been below its historical average. Uh, the GKLN baseline forecast uh, that Matt showed assumes that this recall rate, again, this is the exogenous part of the recall rate applying to those who are waiting, uh, rises back to its pre-COVID level over the next 24 months. Uh, and I'll note that that pre-COVID level was at a historical high. Um, so these individuals under that scenario get reemployed uh, relatively quickly. I'm now going to suggest the possibility that in fact the reemployment rate from temporary layoff uh, could actually fall uh, instead. Uh, why might this occur? As the share of the unemployed on temporary layoff has declined, the average duration of unemployment for those still on temporary layoff has risen. So I show this in the left panel separately um, for those who are classified as waiting and those who are classified as searching. Uh, it's pretty similar. In both cases, the median duration of unemployment has gone from less than four weeks uh, pre-COVID to 18 weeks in August. Uh, in other words, the median person on temporary layoff in August first became unemployed as part of that huge separation surge uh, in April. Okay. Now remember, GKLN account for duration dependence among those who are temporary layoff and searching, but they don't account for it for those who are on temporary layoff and waiting. And the right panel uh, shows a counterpart to the picture map showed uh, of the duration hazard for those who are on temporary layoff and searching, I show the temporary layoff and waiting, you can see that there's a similar declining uh, duration hazard. And I plotted this both for the full sample going back to 1994, uh, as well as uh, just the most recent COVID July to August transitions. Uh, if anything, um, the red dots are below the blue dots, suggesting that the duration hazard has been more important and the gradient steeper uh, in the COVID recession uh, than historically. And so, uh, again, to emphasize, um, this is not going to enter into their forecast of what happens to the recall rate going forward. And I think, you know, for a paper that really shines in its attention to duration dependence among the unemployed, uh, this is a potentially important lacuna. And accounting for it would suggest that the overall reemployment rate from temporary layoff is likely to decline uh, rather than rise in, in the coming months. Uh, next on separations, uh, an extremely unusual feature of the COVID labor market has been the continued high rate of separations from employment into unemployment, uh, despite the fact that the overall unemployment rate has been falling. Uh, so that's why I plot in the left panel. The blue dots show that typically uh, the EDU hazard, so the separation hazard, is lower when unemployment is falling. The red dots show uh, the COVID months. I'm ignoring April 2020 because that would be, you know, somewhere over here. Um, what we can clearly see is that separations have remained well above the historical norm, despite uh, the declines in unemployment. And this finding is echoed uh, by the fact that we still have historically high UI claims every week, uh, despite the fact that the unemployment rate has been coming down. So forecasts of the overall unemployment rate that are more pessimistic uh, implicitly assume these high separations continue. Uh, this could come from aggregate forces, which I'm going to discuss next. Uh, history dependence may also contribute. Uh, so GKLN do not model history dependence among the employed. Uh, there's a recent literature on this topic, and it finds that those with recent spells of unemployment return to unemployment more quickly. Of course, the key question is whether this history dependence reflects true causality or selection. Uh, that also applies to the previous uh, discussion of exit hazards from unemployment. We don't know, it's hotly debated. Um, one thing uh, John and I did uh, in our paper was to estimate this history dependence separately by whether the unemployment spell was temporary or permanent layoff. Uh, and that's what I'm plotting on the right panel. Okay, so to do this, we look at separation hazards of respondents who are employed in their seventh CPS interview and conditioned by their employment status in the previous six interviews. And actually a bit surprising to me, uh, we found if anything, larger history dependence if the spell was temporary. Uh, and this isn't just a, a, an artifact of seasonality. Okay. So uh, you can clearly see uh, this in the right panel, the exit hazard into unemployment is higher for those with more previous months of unemployment. And uh, the red dots, which are the temporary are above uh, the blue dots. Okay. So incorporating yet another dimension of, of heterogeneity, which would be among the employed, 
might suggest uh, that these high separation rates are, are likely to continue. Uh, third, probably the most important driver of what happens to the labor market going forward is overall demand. And uh, this is not a question this paper is particularly well suited to answer since the driving forces, which are the recall rates, vacancies, new separations, all depend on the overall level of labor demand. Uh, nonetheless, uh, we can speculate. Uh, an optic optimistic scenario is simple. We get a fully functional vaccine quickly or else some dramatic improvement in testing capacity or uh, treatment. A pessimistic scenario might involve a new wave of infections as flu season ramps up and diminish policy reports support during the uh, interregnum. How likely is such a scenario? Uh, if you haven't looked at these forecasts, uh, they're a bit appalling. So this is the IMHE forecast. Uh, it's just one particular forecast, but it's one that a lot of people have looked at. Um, and their baseline forecast is that COVID deaths uh, start to rise again in the winter. Uh, they reach a new high in the US in December and they only start to come down because new social distancing measures are imposed. Okay. So it, it's one forecast, but it suggests that this uh, you know, renewed um, contraction in the economy is at least uh, possible. Okay, so let me uh, conclude uh, by saying I found the paper to offer a very nice summary of the COVID labor market and a very useful forecasting exercise. It clarifies uh, a number of things. Uh, I fully agree with their emphasis on temporary layoffs. I should mention, uh, and Matt did too, there are some other papers that come to the same conclusion. Once you start to uh, look at these data, uh, the importance of temporary layoffs really hits you in the face. Um, and I offered a few reasons to be a bit less sanguine about the path forward uh, than their uh, baseline forecast is. Okay, hey, thanks. Um, uh, thanks, that was a terrific presentation and a very clear uh, discussion. Uh, first comment would be uh, Bob Hall, who has something queued up. Can we, um, Anna, can we un uh, unmute Bob? He's coming in. Okay. Okay, Bob, you're very, you're well, I, Okay, finally. Uh, okay, well, this is a great session. Uh, and uh, there's a lot I agree with, especially, uh, uh, well, a lot I agree with, including Gabe's uh, discussion. So I'm only gonna talk about the things I disagree with. Um, one is uh, the paper uh, omits uh, one important branch of the evidence, which is from the employer side, the duration, uh, of a vacancy, which is something that can be gotten directly from the JOLTS survey, uh, is, is an independent measure of labor market tightness according to DMP standard theory. Um, and it, it took a hit initially, but it's completely back to normal. So it's an even stronger indication of the message that uh, the part of the labor market that involves uh, actual direct search is almost normal. Um, it's, it's job, job finding rates are down a little, uh, duration of vacancy is not down at all. Um, there's what, what I regard as, as uh, uh, unnecessary uh, diversion uh, is the discussion of trying to embed this issue in the beverage curve. The beverage curve is not organic to DMP theory. It's not part of the model. It's only a way of displaying the data, but I, th I think it's quite confusing. You can, I've written about this elsewhere, we'll go on. Um, one thing that concerns me deeply is the vocabulary that's used in this paper. Um, uh, just trying to distinguish these two kinds of unemployment, which we all agree on a very important distinction. Um, uh, calling it temporary and permanent unemployment is completely wrong and confusing. And I would ask for, for a change in that in my paper, which has been cited with, with uh, Mariana Kudliak. Um, uh, introduces a different uh, vocabulary, uh, which I think is much better. All unemployment is temporary. No unemployment is permanent. So to distinguish these two types by temporary and permanent is just wrong. Um, uh, so uh, I convened a little panel of uh, experts in this area and we, we after turning over many ideas, uh, 
currently we're calling this recalling unemployment and jobless unemployment. And that captures the key distinction. And I, I don't, I have no uh, intellectual property rights on those names or, or the names could be different, but temporary permanent is just wrong uh, and really, really needs to be changed. Um, uh, so um, uh, I'll leave it at that. The rest of it, I think is, you know, my, my general feeling of, about the paper is quite positive, but we must change the title. Well, I've heard the terms short-term and long-term before. Steve Davis. Thanks. Um, two comments. First, I, I want to endorse the view, and, and Bob just did it in one way, but in general, the labor market's a lot tighter than it appears from the headline. I, I like Bob's focus on the vacancy rate. I do think that a vacancy duration that comes directly out of the DMP perspective, but there's lots of other evidence, some of which was cited in the paper. But then I, I want to draw attention to another thing that I think, uh, which I see is a pretty big elephant that was ignored in the discussion and which has potentially important implications for the future path of unemployment. Uh, so if you look at um, monthly flows from employment to out of the labor force, um, there, were, there were an extra 6 million people who transitioned from employment to out of the labor force in April and May of this year, compared to you know, kind of looking at the baseline. To put that number in perspective, that number is five times larger, actually more than five times larger than the run-up in the measured number of people who are on permanent layoff unemployment in the CPS from February to uh, July. So it's a huge deal. Um, and the last point to make just in way of context is nothing like this happened in the Great Recession. In the, in the, in the Great Recession. And historically, I don't think anything like that has happened any, in any post-war US recession. So this is a very different phenomenon. Uh, its magnitude is huge, and we need to think about what it means for unemployment uh, going forward. So the obvious concern is what will happen when these folks, if they do flow back into the labor force and start looking for uh, jobs again, will they uh, follow dynamics more like the people who uh, expect to be recalled uh, according to the CPS, or will, will they look more like the uh, let's call it the jobless unemployed uh, to adopt Bob's uh, suggested terminology. In, unless I missed it, that the analysis, the analytical framework just totally ignores this issue. And, uh, but if I'm wrong, please correct me, but I certainly didn't see how that gets captured. And it seems to me uh, a first order concern, not so much for what's happened thus far, but, but as we go forward and these people are drawn back into the labor force looking for jobs, uh, what you know? What will it be like? What will that mean for labor market tightness? Thanks. I'm sorry. Thanks, Jason Furman. Uh, thank you. I had uh, two questions for the authors or or the discussant. Um, the first was: This recession had a substantial supply shock component to it that changed the way we could produce things. Um, as a result, we've seen a shift to all sorts of ways of doing things without humans and with less contact. To the degree that that's persistent, um, how would that affect your model? Certainly not something that's captured you know, historically um, as you calibrated, how real do you think it is? Um, the second question is, um, I don't think you said anything um, about um, policy unless I missed it. If you had unemployment insurance being zero dollars a week or six hundred dollars a week or somewhere in between, how would that affect um, you know what you're you're forecasting and how you think about it as well? Okay, um, barring any other questions from the audience, we're back to the authors. Thank you. Um, thanks, Gabe, for the great discussion. I will reply in order. So um, I think Gabe makes a very good point on duration dependence for the temporary unemployed who are waiting. Um, that is something that we could try to incorporate into the model. Um, what, we, what I have now is in appendix figures A53 and A54. If you go to that, you'll see that we have a scenario where the job finding rates of the temporary waiting fall by about a third. That's basically, I think, in the ballpark of what you'd see through the, through the duration dependence. And, and you see that you, you do have a slower recovery, but it still is um, relatively optimistic compared to the forecasts. 
uh, what seems to matter more is actually what happens with job separations rather than vacancies and the recall rate, assuming the recall rate you know, doesn't crash all the way down to zero. Um, as for uh, Bob Hall's comment, we are not wedded to this uh, terminology. Uh, we don't like it either. So we will think about using uh, recall and jobless unemployment instead. Um, first, uh, Steve Davis's comment. So we allow for transitions um, between employment and non-participation as well as between non-participation and unemployment. We don't have micro foundations for what generates those, but it's part of the forecasts. So what we do have going on in the model is a big flow into non-participation. And what we're also seeing in the data are meaningful flows from non-participation into both temporary and permanent unemployment. That in turn leads to congestion. So that force is there. But of course, we're assuming that the people who flow from non-participation into unemployment are going to behave like the people who were in those states in the past. Um, and I totally agree that that's important and there's more that we should do there. Um, for Jason's comment on policy, uh, we don't have a lot directly um, to say about policy at this point, except to the extent that UI policy is affecting, say, the decision of temporary unemployed workers to wait versus actively searching. That would be something that at least I think our team is pretty interested in studying in, in more detail. Um, you know, one hypothesis that I have, for example, is that one reason why so many temporary unemployed were willing to wait is perhaps because of the income support they had during the substantial extension of UI. I will turn it over to Gabe for the last word. I, I will make two uh, quick comments. Uh, on terminology, um, I never want to get into disagreements with Bob. Uh, I do think, you know, as long as we're measuring this in a survey, the CPS that has a term called temporary layoff, I don't see why uh, we would want to adopt a different term from that. Uh, it seems like having two terms for the same thing uh, might be more confusing and, and they're pretty stuck to their terminology. Uh, second, briefly to, to Jason's sort of question on um, the supply shock component. And I think one way to think about that is, you know, there, there's always some churn, uh, there may be more now, uh, but you know, one interpretation of the declining hazard rate uh, for those say on temporary layoff is it's, a, it's a partly a selection effect and you're finding the people who are in uh, industries that just aren't gonna come back and uh, so I think, you know, that interpretation of the declining hazard speaks a little bit um, to, uh, uh, to that aspect. Okay, uh, great. Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> we are going to, uh, so we're going to end this session at 1.10. We have some breakout sessions uh, for lunch. I am actually going to get my lunch and eat it. Uh, in a breakout session. And I would encourage you to, if you're in a time zone for which that makes sense. Uh, if you are in the Zoom participant group, you should have just received uh, a few minutes ago an email from Anna Dawson uh, at Brookings that has the links. So the first session, uh, the monetary actions and business dynamic ones, the papers that are relevant to that are the Hanson, Hubbard and Greenwood session papers. Epidemiology in the Economy, that would be Arnon and Fernandez Villaverdes, uh, for Villa Fernandez Villaverdes and Jones, uh, and then the Labor Markets and Fiscal Policy, that'd be the Gallant, Auerbach, and Ilseki papers. Okay, so I'll see you in a few minutes. And if you're in the webinar version of this, then uh, we'll see you back at 155 sharp. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.